This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Virtual Town Council meeting. This is our second Town Council meeting using Zoom. Our first, our fourth virtual meeting and the second virtual town council meeting where we have provided for public comment. I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. This is also how we will conduct counselor comment throughout the agenda. You'll actually raise your hand and I will tell you to unmute your mic make your comment and mute your mic back again. This meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. Counselors, there is no chat room for this meeting visible to anybody. There isn't a chat room. If you have technical issues, please let Sean and Athena know to make a comment, to ask a question, please click raise hand button if te technical difficulties arise as a re result of using remote participation. I will decide how to address the situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurs. And Thena and Sean will be monitoring council connections and if necessary, we will pause the meeting until you are reconnected. The town has developed a two minute video to pe for people to help them connect to town council meetings through the town website. We'll, sh we'll demonstrate or show that video at some point in the media. Not, we won't show the video, we'll show you the link. So let's move the slides to the agenda. We have a town council meeting coming up on Monday the 13th. We will be skipping Monday, April 20th, which was Patriots Day, and we will meet again on April 27th. We also have upcoming committee meetings on April 7th tomorrow uh, is the finance committee meeting at 2.30. That will actually be available on Amherst Media and you can, you can join it. There will be no public comment though. Uh, Wednesday, April 8th, there will be a CRC meeting, Community Resources Committee at 10.30, I mean at 8.30. There will not be a governance organization and legislative committee meeting on April 8th. We're trying to space our meetings out. Uh, joint meetings of the town council and the school committee to fill the school committee vacancy will be happening on the 14th. We have four applicants. They are Gaston de la Reyes, Jr. of 45 Canton Avenue, Ryan P. Driscoll of 384 Henry Street, Katie Lazandowski of 20 Overlook Drive, and Heather A. Lord of 70F River Glade Drive. The candidates will be interviewed and the council and the school committee will make the decision on the 14th. However, if there are technical difficulties, we have reserved the 16th in order to recognize written material and make the decision. I'd like you to put up the slide regarding the flyer for the parent guardian organization. That'll be up in just a second. Thanks, Sean. just want to call attention to the fact that the parent guardian organization for all five Amherst schools have been working together with Superintendent Morris to create a fundraising fundraiser aimed at defraying the costs 
of supplying Wi-Fi hotspots to students and families identified as not having access to the internet at home. You can see on this flyer, which is in our packet, the GoFundMe page that you go to if you would like to contribute to this. I do want to recognize and particularly congratulate these people for making education access available to all. I understand their campaign, campaign is going quite successfully. We are now going to move to public comment. Let me just state that we will conclude public comment on or before 7.15. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the, at the discretion of the town council president based upon the number of people who wish to speak. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. To, to, to participate in public comment, the instructions are now on your screen. If you join the council Zoom teleconference by Zoom, then you need to raise your hand. If you joined by phone, you need to click star nine. And that will allow us to know who would like to be make a public comment. Is there any public comment at this time? And Sean and um, Athena, I just want to tell you, I don't see, I can see the attendees, but I can't see any hands or any mics. That's correct. Nobody has their hand up right now. Okay. Then in that case, we will continue on. I do have a, a comment to share with people when we get to the housing um, proclamation uh, from John Hornick. So, in fact, our next item is proclamations and commemorations. And could you put the slide up of the resolution? That'll be up in just a second. Okay, we're on to number 5A. Uh, first of all, is there a community resources report? That would be me and Joe. Yes, there is. Um, community Resources Committee is sponsoring this resolution um, to be an interim housing, affordable housing policy to um, recognize the fact that it could take a while to get to a comprehensive housing policy as the council referred to. The Community Resources Committee voted four to one with Councillor DeAngelis, we know, to recommend that the council adopt this resolution. Uh, the no vote was because the councillor did not believe this resolution went far enough for adopting an interim housing policy that that councillor would have preferred that the resolution um, adopt the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust's draft affordable housing priorities policy as our interim policy. So that was the no vote. Um, that's my report. Okay. Um, so Mr. Hornick, who is chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust has written the following statement. It will be added to the packet. This is a brief note to indicate my support for the interim affordable housing policy. I am disappointed that the CRC was unwilling to take on the task of revising the draft policy submitted by the AMA HT at this time. However, I'm pleased that the statement includes language such as Amherst Town Council determines that current efforts to preserve existing affordable housing and add new affordable housing must be redoubled. I believe that the task of developing a more general housing policy will be challenging, particularly in the current context. In the interim, I anticipate that the AMAHT in collaboration with the Community Ves Preservation Act Committee will submit a request to town council to approve the use of CPA funds to support 
an emergency rental assistance program. I hope the town council can ex expedite its review once the proposal is ready. Thank you for your consideration. So at this time, I'd like to um, call for a motion. I need a second. The motion is to adopt the resolution adopting an interim affordable housing policy as presented. Is there a second? A second. second. This is Shalini. Okay. Uh, Dorothy, you also have your hand up. Dorothy, you had your hand up. Was that? Yeah, that was the second. That was the second. Okay. So we have a second from um, Shalini. Please make sure you use your raised hand. Um, is there any further discussion on this motion at this time? Okay, hearing none, then I'm going to call the vote, which also allows us to make sure everybody can hear. Shalini, please yes. mute and say aye. Aye. Brewer. Aye. Thank you. DeAngelis. Aye. Dumont. Yes. Reesmer is yes. Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Ross. Aye. Ryan. George, I can see that you're with us. Yes, go ahead. Can you unmute and say aye or nay? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Sean? Yes. Schreiber? Aye. Steinberg? Aye. Schwartz? Aye. It's unanimous and we actually can hear all counselors and they can hear us. We are now going to move on to the presentations of, for the evening. And we're going to call first on um, Tom Paul Bachelman, who is going to introduce Lev Benezra from the Amherst Survival Center. Thank you, um, Lynn. And uh, we, I think Lev has a slideshow that we're gonna post up there, or I'm not sure if she's gonna do it herself or if Sean's gonna do it. Um, so Len, Lev is the uh, executive director of the Amherst Survival Center and um, has been really taking on a very difficult task the last um, few weeks and has taken it on with, with great gumption and, and a lot of leadership. And I just want to mention that um, at, the, at the precise time when we need the Amherst Survival Center the most is when they are, are struggling the most because they're, they're in great need for volunteers and funds. So. I think Lev is going to give a little context to about food security in Amherst, and as she's she's the one closest to it of anybody in town. So, Lev. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, so much for Excuse having me. Excuse me, Lev. You need to increase the volume on your mic. Um, is that any better? Not much. Uh, I apologize. Give me one second to fuss with my audio levels. Testing, testing. Not really. Did you do your mic at the bottom right of your overall computer? Bottom left. Uh, Let me, is this any better? Much better. Okay. Um, I apologize, there may be a little bit of background noise now. Um, I'm just off my headset and my family is having dinner in the next room. <laughs> um, so thanks so much for having me. Happy to have a couple of minutes to talk about uh, the community needs that we're seeing and specifically how the Emmer Survival Center is responding and what may be needed moving forward. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so we are definitely seeing food insecurity increasing. This is not a surprise as folks are out of work and just 
and kids are home from school, most significantly, we've seen a full 50% increase in the number of people who are coming daily for hot lunch um, for a, a two-week span, kind of immediately following the launch of our new operations. We had a four-time increase in the number of new families who are registering for the household and a really significant four or more time increase in the number of people who are coming back for a mid-month emergency box. We also see a really significant need for expanded delivery and safe pickup options and are still working on those. Um, and I will also just note that the tone has shifted, kind of the, the level of urgency and people's need as they're coming to access food is definitely significant. And the combination of really needing this most essential basic need while also being in, this, in the space that I think all of us can relate to of having so much fear and uncertainty in the world at large. You can go ahead to the next slide. And I think as we think about this need and where it's going to continue to grow, it's really key to think that just a few months ago when the economy was theoretically thriving, the Amherst Survival Center was serving 6,000 people a year. And these were the folks who were facing food insecurity before COVID-19. Now we're also seeing the people who are here after missing one or two paychecks and, what, and that loss of income is enough that they're now experiencing food insecurity. And soon we'll be seeing folks who are experiencing food insecurity after four paychecks or as they're trying to live on unemployment or as other unexpected expenses arise. We're also definitely seeing a reality that people are trying to navigate their needs with various services, other services that are closed or offered in very different ways and just figuring all these things out. Stressful for anyone and really hard for someone who's so connected with so many services where everything is changing all at once. You can go ahead to the next slide. So our response so far has been to really focus on safety first and foremost, and to focus on our food and nutrition programs. So we are providing lunch along with snacks, as well as produce and bread that's all prepackaged and to go. And that's happening in our parking lot. That was the first picture that you saw volunteers under tents in the lot passing out those. Folks line up at cones that are spaced six feet apart outside, so they're social distancing um, in effect uh, as they're waiting. We are also still offering the food pantry. However, our small food pantry where folks would go through and choose items off a shelf like a little grocery store was too small to have any effective social distancing. So we're now giving out um, the full grocery shop in the form of prepackaged boxes. Uh, so folks don't get selection, but they're actually getting more food. Every allocation has at least 25% more food than it did previously, and that's now in our large dining room. Um, in the background of this picture, you can see chairs that are six feet apart in the outside. So folks are waiting outside to come into the building just one or two at a time. They check in at an intake desk um, and then sit on the edge of the room while a volunteer just picks up those prepackaged boxes. We do still have our laundry facilities and lockers and showers that are available for folks who are experiencing homelessness. This is an incredibly vulnerable population who right now has really lost so many other connections that they um, would otherwise have. The businesses where they might have spent time during the day outside of the Amherst Survival Center or use a restroom are closed. We're also not providing the, that community center space for folks to be. Um, our community store, the community programs, our health clinic, our dining area, and our resource center are all temporarily closed. You can go ahead to the next slide. So our response as far as our operations, um, we have almost kept the same hours. We're still open four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, but we have eliminated the Thursday evening hours temporarily. So we're Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from 11 to 3. And really in the span of three weeks, but it was kind of that first week between March 16th and then again on March 19th, we fully revamped our operations twice, essentially trying some things and then doing a, a switch um, with dramatically increased sanitizing and hygiene practices, social distancing in effect. I'll notice the two people are, I will note the two people in the foreground of this picture are live in the same household. It's really nice when family units come to volunteer together because they don't have to stay six feet apart. 
Um, we have this week, or sorry, last week instituted face coverings for all volunteers and staff while working and have really had to adapt to have new volunteers. Uh, I think, apologize, I don't have the statistic off the top of my head, but I think it's probably about 90% of our volunteers were no longer present. Um, we have many, many seniors. We had a huge, large body of uh, students who volunteered with us. And so we've really had to adapt to make roles that are more suited to bringing in new volunteers and um, relying on folks who now are home and have time when they might not have otherwise. And our volunteers have been absolutely incredible. We also have a skeleton crew of staff that's rotating both to minimize exposure for the staff and to make sure that our operations are sustainable if and when some of our staff are either sick or need to be quarantined or wherever else and aren't able to report to the center. So it's really this ultimate focus on efficiency. How can with the fewest people in the building and the fewest people in any given space, can we make more food? Instead of feeding 100 people for lunch with six people in the kitchen, we're needing to prepare and prepackage 150 lunches with a maximum of three people in that space. You can go ahead to the next slide. A really critical component of this response has been the partnerships. Um, the Amherst and Belchertown Senior Centers, Pelham Fire Department, the VA, ServiceNet, and CHD have all helped, have all stepped up to help with delivery either to area seniors or to um, per, uh, clients or participants in VA, ServiceNet, or CHD programs who weren't able to get to the center. We are really pleased to have secured, when we knew we needed to close our health center temporarily, we wanted to make sure that those folks had a place to go for health services and the Community Health Center of Franklin County was able to work out a very streamlined referral process that ensured prompt access to care. Um, and regardless of what the person's insurance status was at the time of going in, and we're using our clinic funds to pay for a taxi or an Uber to get someone up there for an appointment. So we're really pleased about that collaboration. Um, and then again, the Community Health Center of Franklin County, Dial Self AmeriCorps member, and very hopefully Stavros and Community Action have also been able to help with staffing. We found that with our increased utilization of new volunteers, we just need more people who are there consistently, folks who can learn something on Monday and then be able to do it again on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. Um, and those organizations, we're partnering with them. So if they have staff who are furloughed, who would otherwise be furloughed or who don't have work they can do remotely, they can come and work for us um, on our site, stay on payroll at their organization. And we've worked out various cost sharing agreements with the organization. So that's been really wonderful. Um, and we would really like to do more of that. It's something that we need more of. Um, we have a, a agreement in the works with uh, Coal construction and the Coles family to borrow a tractor trailer and a place to park it to have increased storage. Um, and food service and restaurant organizations who have donated food, wonderful partnership with some area donors who have given us funds to be able to buy food from restaurants to help support local restaurants and also reducing our cooking burden. So there have been some really wonderful partnerships that have emerged um, in the response to this process. Thanks. Next slide. So I have been at the Amherst Survival Center for a little over a year, and I think this is really this moment. We, we're an essential service every day, and right now as we are so focused on the food security, the emergency food system portion of our mission, it is just so critical how essential we are. Um, on Friday, 157 people stood in line outside to get hot meals that we were serving, and it was kind of cold and it was raining. And what that indicates to me is, one, that I think we're making great food and we're giving out a really wonderful abundance of produce, and I'm really, really thrilled for the staff and volunteers who are making that happen. And two, that I see every day at the center how essential this is. So that really to me means that we have to think really critically about what are the risks that could present themselves in the next couple of weeks and how do we move forward to ensure that these services continue to be available. Next slide. So 
The thing that I see that we really need moving forward is community investment. It's really clear. I think the entire team of the Amherst Survival Center is doing a phenomenal job. Um, I am completely blown away by the staff and volunteers who have been there every day and what they've been able to accomplish. And it's also clear to me that right now, when we have such a small and lean organization, so few staff, so few, so, so few people who kind of hold that background operations that these services are so critical that we we need a broader community investment in ensuring that these services continue to exist with what may come over the next several weeks or months. Um, and the core ways that we're really looking to do that are, as I mentioned before, with those staffing partnerships, we're really looking to bring other people in to help folks who can commit to at least two full days a week so that we're sharing the leadership and kind of the core knowledge of uh, program or task areas among a broader number of people so that knowledge isn't quite so centralized in case the person who had it needed to be out. We are also really um, calling on the entire community to support the organization financially. We are seeing uh, dramatically increased costs at this time at the same time as we have canceled a number of our uh, fundraising events that would just have helped us to meet our basic uh, operating budget for the year and now are seeing dramatically increased expenses. Additional food that we're buying, staff time for a variety of needs, additional custodial time for cleaning the building, cleaning supplies, um, bandanas because we're uh, to make additional uh, face coverings, et cetera. All these different supplies that are coming up in this process, as well as the food um, and the capacity to keep it going. Um, and then these kinds of creative partnerships that, like, that I outlined, it has been really wonderful to uh, pass off chunks of the delivery to our local seniors to the Amherst Senior Center and have them take on not just the actual functional delivery of it, but a section of ownership around contacting seniors and figuring it out and finding volunteers to actually, instead of just going to a senior center, going to seniors' doors. So those kinds of partnerships have been incredible to see them coming forward, and we, we will continue to need uh, additional support in that regard. Next slide. Uh, so just my contact information. Thanks again so much for giving me an opportunity to speak with you all. My email is lev at amersurvival.org and I'm happy to answer any questions. And then I wanna direct folks, we have a, um, our website is amersurvival.org and amersurvival.org slash COVID-19 is an up-to-date list of all of our services and safety protocols, et cetera, that are in place. Any changes to anything that we're offering will be made there. Um, and our donate page, which is amersurvival.org slash donate, is directing specifically into our COVID-19 hunger response fund at this time and are looking for community support for that as well. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask us that we leave this last slide up while we ask counselors if they have any questions. And while you're contemplating that, I have to do a full disclosure. And that is that I've had a long involvement with the Elmer Survival Center and I'm still a member of their board of directors. Are there questions from the council? Yes, Dorothy. Please un yeah, there you go. Dorothy. Did it work? I it think. Did. Okay. Um, this is a question for Lev. Um, I know my son-in-law just organized his uh, staff into pods where there was no overlapping skill sets, so that because if somebody gets sick in a in a gr group, then the whole team has to shut down. I was wondering if you were able to do that in um, your setup. So we have a modified version of that. Um, so starting on Thursday, March 19th was when we put this into effect that uh, Roughly, we have a couple of staff who are working fully remotely, um, and then the remaining staff who are taking care of the day-to-day -day operational and the floor duties are broken in roughly into two teams. Um, I would not 
there is not no overlap. There definitely is some overlap. The intent there of the two teams based on the public health folks that I spoke with was to reduce the staff members' exposure and reduce the likelihood that multiple staff members would get sick at once. Yeah. Um, the intent is that because we're being uh, very conscious of social distancing within the center and are wearing face coverings that just because one person got sick doesn't necessarily mean that every single person like who had been at the center would um, need to be quarantined. But the part about the uh, diffusing knowledge and sharing that among many people and making sure that there are many people who hold the systems um, are Basically, our organizational plan is now on flip charts on the wall of the center. <laughs> Kathy Shane, you have a question. Uh, yes, I do. Thanks, Lev, um, for reaching out to us and for what you're doing in the community. I had two questions. If you could be a little bit more specific on kinds of um, help that you need because we have we have a neighborhood association and we can put out a list to them so in terms of people will you take people who are over 65 is there anything they can do or is it mainly you're trying to keep them out of the workforce um, in terms of food and food donations do you mainly want um, canned goods or canned and fresh so those are my two Money, I can understand money is money, but yeah. type, types of people and types of food. Yeah, thank you. At this time, we are not actively seeking food donations. Um, it takes actually an enormous amount of people power um, and capacity to receive those, weigh them, sort them, shelve them, and then distribute lots of sort of dissimilar items, um, which normally we absolutely prioritize because it adds a tremendous amount of uh, variety to the food pantry and what folks can shop for. But at this point, again, we have really had to optimize for efficiency and so are not for both that reason and for the potential of contagion and needing to leave things to the side before we sort them and use them um, are not actively seeking food donations at this time. We haven't shut them down and certainly restaurants or food services or farms are bringing us food. So there are some that are coming in, but that's not something that we're actively seeking because there's a lot of process there. As far as people, we are we have not set in place a specific restriction around an age marker or we don't ask for people's medical histories in terms of pre-existing conditions or anything like that. We trust that adults are making choices that are right for them about whether what amount of exposure or not feels appropriate and are doing that in accordance with whoever they need to speak with that. So we do not have any hard line around that. Um, we are definitely accepting volunteers who can do a shift or two each week if they can commit to doing that each week and kind of further prioritizing people who can do multiple shifts in a week. Um, but we're the thing that I guess I'm most actively appealing for right now is that we're interested in other partnerships, whether it's with the town or with other organizations or businesses where someone might be out of work um, or have a significant amount of time. I would, we would love to have three or four or five more people who are there between two and four days a week for full days, like really uh, taking on leadership over an area, again, in that effort to further diffuse knowledge and make sure that we're more resilient um, in the event that some staff needed to be out for a period of time. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions from the council? Yes, Dorothy. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in hearing some more details about how uh, restaurants um, whether open or closed, are contributing to your food service? Great. Um, well, the first is, and I'm not going to name specific restaurants because I won't get them all, um, but they will. Uh, we've had a wonderful run on our Facebook feed of thanking various restaurants. So one of the pieces that happened was when restaurants made the choice to close their doors, they contacted us. Um, and it was so touching. We have these local restaurants who are at, you know, small family businesses or larger businesses, but folks who are at this really critical point um, in their business. And as they were closing for a period of time, reaching out to us to say, 
we have all of this food and whether it was produce or stuff that they hadn't cooked to give us to that. So that was one of the pieces that happened, really beautiful. Um, the other thing that we have been able uh, to partner with local restaurants around is that we've had um, a couple of individual donors or a large group through UMass Five uh, Credit Union and through the JCA who can, uh, made a substantial donation with the specific goal that it be designated to purchase food from local restaurants who are doing takeout service. And so what that provided, um, UMass Five donated a cooked lunch. There were pot pies that were already prepared from the Delaney house. Um, the JCA is basically we can use that money and then go and spend it at Bueno Asano and get a bunch of burritos. And so it creates an opportunity for there to be a day where we don't have to cook. Folks get delicious food that's a break from what we've been making um, with our three people in the kitchen for 150. Um, and then we're also supporting a local restaurant in the process. So that's been something that we're doing with donations that are designated specifically to meet that dual purpose. That's certainly not how we're providing lunch on most days. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions from the council? So, Lev, thank you for being uh, there. Yeah. Um, I was actually chaired the committee that recruited Lev, and we could not be more proud of her. She has been a stalwart in this uh, perfect storm. So, we thank you, and Lev, we look forward to um, hearing more about you and the progress of the Survival Center over time. You're doing a great service to our community. Thank you. Thanks. It's really my honor, and I think all of us there feel that um, in a time of such uncertainty, it's uh, it's a gift to be able to do something concrete and helpful. So, thank you to any to all of you who are or want to be a part of it. Thanks. So we're going to go back on to Paul. You're next. Thank you, Lynn. So there is a slide deck with this, Sean. Um, perfect. Um, so this is, uh, go to the next slide. We're going to, we've already done the third bullet, so we don't need to um, do that. So I'm going to give you a quick status report, and this will be a shorter presentation than in the past, but uh, Julie Fetterman, our health director, is here. So there are opportunities for if you, anybody has questions, you'll be able to ask her specific questions. So the next slide shows um, the where we were yesterday, and so to update these numbers every year, every week I have to update them because the new numbers come out at noon on the day of. So instead of 12,500 cases, we now have 13,803, I'm saying again, 13,837 cases. Instead of 231 deaths, we're up to 260 deaths. Um, and what we will be showing uh, beginning uh, today is the number of cases in Amherst. There, uh, and we're at, I believe, 10 cases as of today uh, in Amherst, and that will show on the COVID, AmherstCOVID19.org website every day. That'll be updated. Um, the, um, so so the, the numbers that we're starting to see now is based on the action or inaction from two weeks ago. It takes about two weeks for the social distancing uh, measures to take effect. So as everyone has mentioned, the, the, gov the governor and everyone down the road the next seven to 21 days are crucial. Uh, we expect there to be a significant uptick in our um, in the cases throughout the Commonwealth, uh, and it'll become especially apparent in our hospitals. And that's the thing to monitor in terms of the number of uh, emergency room visits, the in ICU uh, uh, entrances, uh, and the number of ventilators, quite honestly. And we're at, from talking to medical officials, we're at a crisis point. So everything that we can do, we must be doing to bend that curve and to flatten the curve. So that's where our job comes in. Um, and um, so we can go to the next slide. So you, you notice, you know, we, we recognize that a lot of, every, every week more things are being implemented. So the governor has extended the non-essential business closures and the um, prohibitions of gatherings by 10 or more people until May 4th. That May 4th seems to be the new date. That's the school uh, date, and it's the new date that we're all sort of measuring ourselves to. Unlikely that anything that we'll be doing anything significantly different on May 4th. It's just our date. It's a it's a it's our it's our milestone, and we're going to probably continue all these actions beyond that. So next slide. 
the new things that we we have done is we uh, continue to encourage our employees to work from home. We don't want them, if they're able to work from home, we, they don't have to be on site. We encourage them to do that. We, we working with the school department, we placed our playground equipments off limits, both the school equipment and the town's equipment. Uh, we have uh, closed Puffer's Pond and basketball and other courts as of Friday. Uh, you're allowed to walk through, you can do individual fishing, but we will um, ask people who are gathering in small groups to move on. Uh, we are trying to do everything we can to minimize social gatherings. And uh, it's, I know it's really hard for everyone because we're all cooped up. You'll get a beautiful day like today and everybody wants to be out and go visit Puffer's Pond. Uh, you can walk. Uh, we encourage you to maintain social distance when you are walking. You will, we will not allow you to stop and put down a blanket and hang out there, even if you're the only one there, we can keep you moving. Um, and also just to make it formal that we are not uh, enforcing metered parking uh, uh, um, for, with parking tickets at this, for the last few weeks. We won't do, be doing that for the time being. So next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about town operations, which is the next slide. Um, so again, this is the team, the team, our core team, our COVID response team that we've been working with. And one of the things that um, you know, Rahm Emanuel said was that uh, personnel is policy. And that has never been more important than it is today and never more evident than it is in the town of Amherst. Uh, because you have incredibly experienced people who have been here for decades, who have seen a lot of things. No one has seen what we're seeing today but they're drawing on their years of experience to bring, to help make decisions. Every decision is a, a day of, the day of uh, decision that day, you know? Um, so, and, and I think, you know, even though I have many years of experience in municipal sector, I'm the baby of the group in terms of uh, uh, experience in the town of Amherst. So we are just really blessed to have highly experienced, highly um, skilled people in these important positions. Um, they, they are alive, working on this program, that everybody's really inspired to be working for the town at this moment. They, we recognize the challenges that we have, um, and they're not flum flummoxed by the challenges, that people are pretty even keeled, and I think that's the kind of message that we want to be sending to the public, that, that it's hard, but we, we feel like we're making decisions every day, and we trust each other. So, next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about, we always, I always talk about the continuity of operations. I feel it's important for me to let you know where we are and we're actually in really good shape right now. You know, knock on wood, this may change overnight. We just don't know. Um, two of our firefighters who had been quarantined came off of quarantine uh, today. We have five firefighters who we brought up from the student force who were activated today. So we should have uh, an adequate force of firefighters because we anticipate there might be more exposures at that level. Um, our police department and dispatch units are all healthy and, and filling their shifts as, as, we, as we need. The wastewater treatment plant and water treatment um, operators are all healthy. And you know, there are some issues with some you know, family things where, where we have to adjust schedules, but that was is our, in our best interest to do that anyway. Uh, our other departments, finance, uh, health, and IT, human resources, all doing really well. Next slide. So uh, last Thursday, we did a um, two one-hour live call-in events uh, with uh, superintendent of schools and uh, Julie Fetterman, and those were really, um, really popular, actually. Uh, we had 64 people in the first hour, we had 46 in the second, so 110 people participated, um, and we each made like uh, five or ten minute comments and then just fielded questions from the public, and it worked, worked very well. Um, we're doing uh, uh, my normal cup of joe, which will be virtual, um, on Friday from 8 to 9.30. Um, and so I encourage people to have their coffee ready and we'll be sipping coffee together and we'll be answering as many questions as we can during that time period. And then also want to really recognize um, uh, Brianna for putting together the, our AmherstCOVID19.org um, web, web page, uh, which will, website, which will be the repository for a lot of information on from everything from what you what you need and what you can give to um, you know just the operations of the town and, and where we stand, it's updated daily with the latest statistics. Next slide. 
So what's ahead? We're about to enter, you know, four, six, you know, the next two weeks especially are going to be pretty intense. Uh, you know, we, everybody's anticipating that this is going to get kind of gruesome. You know, in New York, they're talking about using a, a public park for a mass burial. It's, it's really going to be difficult for people. And it's, I hope it rings true to everybody that as the weather warms up, we need to be even more intense about staying home. Um, and we're going to be monitoring our public trails to see about if there's too many people on them, we might take the extraordinary step, step of needing to close those. But at this point, we're not doing that. Um, in terms of outreach, I'll continue to do uh, weekly updates to the council and whenever the council meets, I appreciate the council giving the opportunity and to dedicating the time for this type of thing for the public. A cup of joe on Friday and then the new website. We're working with the bid and the chamber to talk about the impact on local businesses, both the sort of resources that are available to businesses, the impact on them, but then looking down the road in terms of recovery and being a resilient Amherst. And so all three of those conversations are happening simultaneously. And a little bit later, you'll hear us talking about the financial implications uh, of this um, pandemic on our finances and on the state's finances. Uh, next slide. So we just already talked about this. So now I'd like to just open it up to anybody who has questions. And I mentioned Julia's here and um, maybe I'll see if any questions are out there for folks, if that's okay, Lynn. Paul, I'm gonna suggest that you start with Julie and uh, answer the question around face masks. Okay, Julie. We can, we can take the slide down, Sean, if you want. Julie, are you there? Yes, sorry, forgot I muted myself. <laughs> so um, face masks, yes. So we've all seen that um, CDC has come to the conclusion that wearing face masks, homemade face masks is a good idea for the general public. So I wanna reiterate that um, surgical masks are really for healthcare providers. No one needs to be wearing those, but homemade cloth masks are, or, or face coverings are what people should be wearing. And there's all kinds of um, directions online for how to make those masks. Uh, people are doing a lot of research about what type of masks are best. Um, I think a couple of the things that I'll mention if you're making your own is that you, or, or using a scarf that you have, you really want to use a tightly woven cotton fabric. So not everyone is a sewer, but um, a tightly woven cotton fabric are often those um, thin quilting fabrics that are, that you often see in fabric stores. And that if you know a sewer probably has a nice stash of them. Um, a two layered homemade mask with one layer being flannel and one layer being that that tightly woven cotton fabric is one of the ones that they feel is capturing things well. There's a lot of experimentation around then putting a type of insert in there made out of, a, of maybe coffee filters or a folded paper towel or part of a vacuum cleaner bag. So lots of research being done on all of those types of materials. And I would encourage you to, until some specific guidance comes out about that, um, look around on the internet and see what you find about that because it's pretty interesting. Not all fabrics and materials are the same. So a lot of us have woolen scarves or loosely knitted scarves. Even if they're wrapped around a few times, those aren't really doing well because they're porous. There are little holes all over the place. The, the purpose of having something really tightly woven, like a high quality sheet, a piece of a pillowcase, um, an old flannel shirt, those things are really stopping the little tiny microns that can be getting through. So people are urged when they're out and about to wear a face covering, but the purpose is really to protect yourself in case you are coming within less than six feet of another person. So really what you wanna be doing is social distancing. You want to be six feet or more apart. But because when you're going to a grocery store or even just getting out of your car in the parking lot, the possibility that then you would be coming in more close contact with someone could happen just even for a fairly short period of time, the mask adds that barrier, that 
is protecting you that you might not need if you're just walking through a field by yourself. So it's not that all the air around you has particles in it. It's when you're close up with other, uh, um, alongside other people. So along with that, I also just want to mention um, we do really want to see people outside, but it's very concerning already yesterday. Lots of people were seen outside without masks on and coming up close to each other because now that we all want to be outside, it's, it's just human nature to want to say hello to your neighbor and to be coming up close to someone, or if you're walking on a trail, to be too close together. So again, that's why we're going to be kind of monitoring what's happening in the community because we want people to be outside, but this is, this is really a very critical moment when we have the capability to stop the transmission of the disease. And I think that while it's hard to be keeping this up, and sometimes it's even hard to do it for ourselves, we have to think about that we're doing it also for someone else. And we don't know who that person is. We don't know who that person is who has an underlying healthcare condition. And then we also don't know all the people in the hospital who are being exposed by all of these patients. We're actually protecting them, the less people who get sick. If I could just follow, follow up on that. When you wear a face mask, Julie, and then you come home, do you just put that in your pocket or what are you supposed to do with it? Because assuming that that's protecting you, what's protecting yes. you? It's Thank you for the prompt. <laughs> uh, yes, when you come home, you wanna wash that face mask and you don't have to put it in the washing machine necessarily. You know, a couple little face masks is, you know, gonna get lost at the bottom of the machine. You can rinse those out in your bathroom sink using just a little bit of detergent of some kind in there and some really warm water, swish it around. Um, there's no special laundering directions, even when someone actively has disease and is washing their laundry. It's just regular washing with warm water and some type of detergent. Um, so having two of them might not be a bad idea. You have one when you go out, you wash it, you hang it up to dry. Then you have another for when, while that one is drying. Um, and also getting back to the different types of masks. So again, um, if you have an N95, it's a great thing to donate because really the surgical masks and the N95s are still in short supply. And, um, you know, all of us who are going to the store, or going out for a walk or going to the pharmacy, we don't need that kind of face covering. It's really when people are interfacing with um, people who are sick or are potentially sick who need those types of masks. Okay, other questions from either Paul for either Paul or for Julie from the council. Steve, you are have your hand up. So the New York Times had a map of the United States by county, um, and it had the areas that were growing the most quickly and the areas that were growing the most slowly. And Hampshire County was in the, I think, the highest category where the number of cases were doubling every three days. So is that what you're, is that accurate? Or is it, I know we're talking about very small numbers. Compared yeah. To yeah. Well, thank you for the question. I, um, I think something that's really important to realize is that um, different states are in different um, um, places around the spectrum of getting their testing up to speed. So Massachusetts right now, we have we have in greatly increased our, po our um, capability to test and then process those tests. So when we're looking at the numbers, we're looking at the people who've gotten tested. So first of all, because we don't have widespread testing in Massachusetts or across the country, we're not getting really the entire picture of the burden of disease in our communities. So now that we're seeing more testing happening, it makes total sense that we're seeing more cases reported. That's probably information that's kind of just behind the times. The, de the disease has been in Hampshire County and we just haven't had a way to quantify it. So sometimes when we're comparing between states while um, some of the overall trends are of course useful as we see things going down in New York City. Um, the, the, the current um, rise in cases in Hampshire County is probably due to the increase in testing. Kathy, I believe you're next. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Paul, this question is for you and it's actually one I 
sent in because a resident asked it if you see um, a group of students or young people meeting, having a party, 10, more than 10, um, what do you do? Can you call the police? If you call the police, will the police come and do something? So how do you, um, if, and it's not, and the person who contacted me, it wasn't a noise issue, it was a concern that was a, a larger than what you would want gathering. Um, and you can see it out on the paths also, but it doesn't tend to be 10, but it's five people clustered together. But this was more on a residential street. Um, so what is, what can the resident do and what will be the police or where do they call and what would be the response? Yeah, I appreciate that because this is one of those things where our thinking has changed over time. Just like with masks, we start to get new information. We start to change our thinking and be more aggressive on some of the enforcement. So yes, if you see a group of people, 10 or more gathered, call the police, you can call 911. They will send a cruiser up and educate the people there about so proper social distancing. Um, and and so that that is, and the police chief and the dispatch units are, are prepared for that. Um, you know, in any kind, we're, we're mostly about education and trying to inf help people understand what the dangers is are because most people aren't, several some people aren't really recognizing that they've been told early on that you're young you're invulnerable it's not true um and so helping the people recognize help, helping people recognize the danger they're putting like other people in like julie said is really important so the question is yes if you see a group call 911 uh, if they're not responding to some other um, domestic violence issue or something like that they will send a cruiser up and and talk to folks and see what's going on saying hey could you break it up a little bit? So, Evan, thank you. You're next. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have two questions, uh, which are for Paul. Although uh, one comment, just based on that last question, is uh, I have seen people who are young and people who are older in gatherings of more than ten. So I hope that we can refrain from doing things like immediately assuming it would be students or young people in such a situation. Um, my questions are one. It wasn't that long ago that there was a conversation about not um, announcing or releasing numbers of cases in Amherst. Uh, clearly, that's also a decision that has changed over time. Uh, so I'd be curious just to know um, what led to that that shift, um, why we're releasing numbers, but the value is in that. Um, but also to hear um, you and perhaps also Julie talk a little bit about how we're protecting the privacy of individuals um, who test positive. And then the second thing was with regard to the announcement that uh, we're suspending parking enforcement um, and just curious about our parking enforcement personnel, if they've been sent home, if they've, if they've been sort of reassigned to other tasks, um, what's happening there? Thank you. Uh, I'll do the second one first just because it's quick. Yes, they, they are still working. They're still employed. Um, they have they are still enforcing uh, parking where people park in a handicap zone or at a loading zone. Those those um, laws have not gone away if you're too close to the um, intersection. So they're still actively doing that. Uh, they, we've also employed them to do other um, duties as as, a, as required. And so they've helped us on a number of different issues. So we have them actively working on different things. Uh, as to the first one, you know we. We initially did not want to release numbers because it was, and Julie can speak to this more, more about, about privacy for the individuals. Um, and then because a lot of other communities are releasing individual numbers, it became, it made me worried that uh, the credibility of the town was, uh, people might start to question, why are you not releasing the numbers? And at a certain point, we're at, it's going to be at such a number that, um, you know, it's going to be like, okay, we're, we're ticking up. We didn't, um, so we didn't think that there was much harm in releasing the number, um, and and there and it, if it would quash a little bit of the sort of skepticism, we thought it would be a benefit. Julie, do I add anything to that? Yeah, thanks, Paul. You said that well. Um, in general, when we have communicable diseases, one of the ways that we protect people's privacy is by not really talking about how many of them there are any um, demographics about those folks. Um, the Department of Public Health was really content, was encouraging and um, while they didn't write a formal order, they really were discouraging towns from 
releasing those numbers when they were small. Um, but as more cases started appearing in more towns, there was a lot of pressure from residents around the Commonwealth feeling like they wanted to know that information. Um, and so we decided to do that because we don't want people to feel like somehow there's information that's being held from them. I think one of the one of the problems is that, for example, our case count today is 10 and um, there's much more disease burden than than that floating in this community and all around Hampshire County. So it it can also, when the numbers are low and testing hasn't completely ramped up, it can give kind of a false impression. And while this is the time when we really want people to take those measures to social distance, um, we don't want people to um, sort of take heart that we only have 10 tested and confirmed cases because um, really the virus is in Western Massachusetts and we all have to protect ourselves. Um, we do everything that we can to protect people's privacy. Um, and the concept was that when you have smaller numbers that, um, you know, in, ta in a town, this isn't a big city, this is a town and um, that people might be trying to put together various pieces of information from people they knew um, might incorrectly assume that this person was the person who had COVID or, um, that there could be some um, rumors going around or that kind of thing. And um, because people, this is a time when people are really frightened and um, sometimes that can um, be something that's detrimental to the folks who are sick. Um, and we have heard from, heard from, from cases that they're really hoping that everything is being done in complete confidentiality, which it is. So I hope that answers your question. Right, Shalini. Uh, thank you. Um, so when, uh, I just want to say thank you for the great website that's created. And I wonder if it'd be helpful to have cross links because we have on our town website, uh, the COVID alerts. And if, when you click on that, if you could give a, a link to the new website there and then on the new website give a link back. Uh, the other thing I, I was uh, wondering is if you could get an update on uh, spaces created for the homeless population, if there's any progress with respect to that. We heard what's happening in Northampton, but if there's anything, any, any update with respect to Amherst. And also, do we know about the local and regional hospitals with respect to space and equipment? Are they geared for increased numbers and so forth? And lastly, about groceries. Because I think that's another question people have, like the masks, like how, to what extent do we, how do we handle the groceries that we're getting home? Thank you. Julie? Shall I take all of those? <laughs> oh, you pick what you want. I'll take up the others. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the shorter one, which is the groceries. Um, so we've got, our grocery stores are doing a great job social distancing people. Um, some stores are letting only a certain amount of people in at a time. Some stores are wiping down your cart for you. Others are providing wipes for you to, to um, wipe down your cart. So um, one thing is, sadly, we don't want you to use your reusable bags. We want you to go in and um, use the bags that they are um, that they're giving you. So um, you want to wipe down your cart and get your items. And then when you go home, the suggestion is to put them in your garage or outside or in some unused spot. And you can let them sit there for a while because um, the virus will die, for instance, on cardboard. So you could let them sit there for 24 hours. Of course, you've got items that need to come in right away. And so if you wipe those down with a Clorox bleach solution or what works best is um, a wipe because otherwise it's awfully wet. I've done that myself and it's messy. So if you wipe them down with Lysol or a bleach wipe, let them sit for 10 minutes because you want to have that contact on the item and then you can put it away things like onions, fresh vegetables, you can just put them in the sink and wash them with soap and water. 
it's a lot of work. You have to then let them dry, then put them in the fridge or wherever you're gonna store them. Um, and then those shopping bags that you brought home, um, you can either keep them in the garage for 24 hours or you could just spray that if they're plastic bags, again, you could just spray them down with something, let them dry, and then they've been disinfected and you could use them again. Um, let's see. So then I'll go back to hospitals. Yeah. So we've been in close contact with Cooley Dickinson and with Bay State. Um, both hospitals are doing a lot and have been even before this happened, but of course, as soon as it did happen to create more spaces in their hospitals to come up with more equipment. Cooley Dickinson is our, I think the hospital that a lot of us think of as our community hospital. We're in close, close contact with them. They've been able to rearrange their units so that they have much more space for bringing in more patients who will have COVID. Um, they also are, there's a regional system for requesting uh, the equipment that they need. But like everyone, it's possible that in this area, once the surge comes, there'll be more of a demand for things like ventilators and N95s and other medical equipment. And that's another reason why um, even simple masks and N95s, we wanna make sure those are really reserved for the healthcare workers. Your first question about um, our homeless folks. So we work on this every day, coming up with what will be the best scenario for how we care for folks um, in the shelter in Amherst and also some of the folks that are on our streets in Amherst also. So, we have about three weeks ago now, we implemented having healthcare workers screen all the guests who come to Craig's doors. So when someone arrives there, they get a temperature check, they get questions asked of them about how they're feeling. Um, anyone who seems to not be feeling that well gets their lungs list listened to. Um, and then these same, same healthcare providers have been helping the shelter staff to really set up the shelter in a way that um, maximizes social distancing so that the cots are as far away from each other as possible for when people sleep. Um, dinner is now served on individual little trays so that people have more distance from each other. Um, and happy to report that at this point, no one has had to be brought to the hospital because they were exhibiting signs of, of the illness. So um, feeling really good about what they're doing at the shelter to really talk with guests, um, promote social distancing, disinfect surfaces all the time, and then most critically assess the health of the guests coming there. Um, we do know that the time will come when we will have um, a person experiencing homelessness who's positive for COVID-19. And so we have developed another site for isolating those, those individuals. We have set up rooms for them. We have, um, and I don't know, Paul, if you wanna say a little bit about this, about where this is happening or. Yeah, I don't think we're quite ready for that yet. Okay. The host right. hasn't allowed us for that. Yes. So we have um, we have everything in place for when we get that first case. We are um, looking for health staff, and um, really we're working on this one seven days a week, so that as as much of the country is, because this is a population who is the most vulnerable, and is also at very high risk for severe disease. So by getting these baseline assumptions. Um, physical assessments also of people. It means that for so many of our guests who come back to the shelter night after night, um, folks have sort of an understanding of their respiratory status and have developed a relationship with them, which is really helpful in helping feel, people feel some trust in being able to talk about how they're really feeling. So I'd just like to jump on that as well. Um, so we have been in uh, close contact with City of Northampton, talking with the mayor, I talked with them regularly uh, this morning over the weekend. Uh, Julie talks with their health director every day, multiple times a day probably, um, comparing notes and working together on trying to address this issue. 
um, it's it's a, it really speaks to the lack of a statewide policy on addressing the needs of people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, but that doesn't solve our problem now. We are looking at it from these two communities working together to, to try and figure out the best solution. The um, One of the limiting factors um, is about having qualified staff who are able to staff a, a place for people to go. That is the key limiting factor for us. We, um, you know, I was on a call on Sunday with um, the person who was in King County in Washington State, it's where Seattle is, and they're really up ahead of the curve. But they, they, from what they're talking about, what they have implemented, they're about a week or 10 days ahead of where we are in terms of what they're implementing. And they talked about how they were just making decisions on the fly and trying to make things work. We're learning from them. We're trying to do the best that we can. Uh, the issue is you've got two relatively small communities working to, to address it because we're doing that because no one else is at this moment in time. We really need the state to be taking a more proactive role. The state has done focused its energies on certain things like Mass Mutual, uh, DCU Center and in Boston, um, but we still have a large community of people who um, are homeless and we need to help them. And and it's, it's an important thing because it's not just for the individuals, which it really is the most important thing, but also for the community at large, because um, again, every the reasons we put in these restrictions about social distancing with people who are partying or or who are um, playing basketball or something like that is to is to limit the amount of community spread of the disease. So everything we can do um, to help um, people create distance between. Uh, uh, where they where they live and where they're hanging out is really important. Um, as Julie said, it's something we um, work on multi every day, and, it's taking, and we, we devote a lot of time to it because it's so important. We find it it's really important to our community. Andy, you're next. Yeah, uh, just first of all, thank you to Paul and Julie and the rest of the leadership team for the great work that they're doing. I think the whole community appreciates it. Um, just a really quick um, observation on the hiking trails. Um, you having used uh, hiking trail a little bit today, we really need the opportunity to get outside and get some exercise and walking is one of the things we can do. But to educate people, if they're gonna stop and stop with their kids on the side of the trail, they got to be six feet off the edge of the trail and people need to take responsibility for that. And we need to encourage it and make that part of our education because when they stop within six feet of the trail, that's when the problems occur. And just as a, as a side note to that, we're, we will, um, at this point, we aren't putting trash cans out in, in those areas because we want people to pack their own trash in and pack it out. Uh, we don't want to put our workers at risk by handling other people's trash. So we're asking the public to be responsible. And if they, if they have trash, that they take it home with them and dispose of it properly at home. Alyssa, you're next. Thank you. Um, everything has been really great and incredibly informative. And I just want to ask that we remind ourselves occasionally and I know that Julie knows this, and I know the public health people know this, but I want the public to know that we know this too. Not everyone has a garage to keep their stuff in, and if they do, it might not be dry or mouse-free, just like not everyone has a second refrigerator or freezer to keep foodstuffs in, just like not everyone has the ability to even obtain things like Lysol wipes to wipe down every piece of grocery, which is in fact a new recommendation that we've not heard before tonight. So on the one hand, it's like we are constantly trying to figure out how to you know, make more progress on this. And at the same time, we are not necessarily having realistic expectations of our fellow human beings. I myself have been to the grocery store, had someone in the family go to the grocery store three times a week, haven't had antibacterial gel in the house for over a month, don't have any Lysol or, or you know, sanitizing wipes. Unless we keep going back to the store, we're not all necessarily gonna have those things. So I, I appreciate the recommendation and the fact that it's new, but I just wanna caution people to not say, well, if I can't do that, I might as well not do anything. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, 
Yes. First of all, it doesn't have to be in a garage. It can be in just a spot that's out of the way that um, doesn't have traffic. And if that's not possible, um, the other thing is that if people have bleach in the house, and I know that's a really hard thing to get to, but the best thing if, is if people can get their hands on bleach because you only have to take three teaspoons of bleach and mix it in a cup of water and cut a paper towel roll, perhaps like in a third, and then soak that third of a paper towel roll in that solution of bleach and water and you've got a bleach wipe. Um, so really just being able to wipe something down with um, a not never straight bleach. Bleach should always be diluted. Um, it's a nine parts water to one part bleach. And again, three teaspoons in a cup of water. And that gives you a very inexpensive disinfectant. Um, so, and then if, if no one has bleach in the home, it's also, things can just be washed with soap and water for a little bit of time, 20, you know, your happy birthday, your 20 seconds, and then allowed to dry. Um, that's hard to do with frozen foods, which is why having something to wipe them down is easier, but it can still be done with a frozen food also. Dorothy, you are next. Okay, um, a comment and a question. Um, I just wanna say that I am confident that we in Amherst are doing as best as we can. Um, that if there's something practical and rational and to do, that it's being done. So that's, for me, some pretty high praise. Um, the other question is um, to Julie, um, do we have any stats or information on good recoveries after people have been on ventilators? Uh, the recent article in the New York Times suggested that the ventilator frenzy perhaps was an illusion that the majority of people coming off the ventilator do not return to a quality of life. And uh, I, I, my friends are in active discussion about changing their, um, their wills and their proxies, their healthcare proxies at this moment, and considering putting in do not put me on a ventilator. So I'd be interested to know if you have information on this. Well, thank you, Dorothy. Um, I think that's something that I can't area can't answer. That's not an area of expertise for me. Um, I think it's really something that people need to talk over with their own personal healthcare provider. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Darcy, I'm sorry, Darcy, you're next. Um, but um, I just wanted to ask a question about the homeless shelter. Um, the I am really happy to hear that there is something that looks like it's in the works for people who test positive. If if the shelter needs, will the shelter need to close down and then also need to have a second location for the rest of the population in the shelter if someone tests positive? Thank you, that's a good question. So I've been focusing on isolation because that's our first step is to make sure that a person who is sick immediately has a place to go. Um, the second piece of that is evaluating who has come in contact with that person. Um, have they been at the shelter before? When were they there? Who were they in contact with? And those folks would then need to be in quarantine. And that is also something that we're planning for. And there's something in the works for that? Yes. Yay. That's great. All right. I want to thank Paul for the update, uh, Julie, for ongoing updates that you've been giving us. Uh, this has been informative and Let's us know how Amherst is moving through all of this. We are going to move on to the rest of the council's agenda at this point. And that, if you can scroll up, scroll up to the town financial discussion, 
Paul, I believe this is you and Sonia. Uh, that's right. So thank you, Julie, for being there. And just as a sort of closing statement, I do I want to echo what Lev had said earlier, which um, it sounds odd, but it's real privilege to be serving Amherst at this time and um, feeling that um, we get the support from the council and the members of the community and the trust. It's a really hard issue, but I, we feel really buoyed by the confidence that you put in us. So, um, so if we can go to the slide, Sean, um, the slide deck, I believe. So this is a um, update on where we are on our finances, given the um, uncertainties in today's markets and the finances. And the, you know, the spoiler is like, we don't know. And I think nobody knows, but we're going to talk a little bit about what we don't know tonight. So to go to the next slide. Um, so the things that we want to talk about, we want, I want to make a few announcements. We want to tell you what we, do, what we know and what we don't know, and then talk a little bit about tie lines. Next slide. So first thing, um, effective today, that the, the state legislature passed uh, some, some uh, a law on last week. And so uh, the executive, which is the town manager, can make these statements. We are, our original due date for fourth quarter real estate bills have now been moved to June 1st. Our fourth quarter uh, bills for personal property, which were originally due on May 1st, are now June 1st. The next slide. So in any um, bill issued with a due date of March 10th or later has a new due date of June 1st. June 1st is the magic date for almost all the bills that you will owe. Uh, again, the same with water and sewer bills if they were issued uh, prior to March 10th. Um, and then the applications for any kind of personal exemption or tax deferrals, which was normally May, April 1, that due date is also June 1st. So June 1st, when it comes to taxes to the town or fees to the town, that's the new, the new um, end date. Next slide. So in addition to that, uh, all interest payments and other penalties, if you were paying late, are waived. So there'll be no interest or penalties for any kind of late payment. And um, so in essence, what that allows you is that you can actually have until June 30th to pay your bills without any penalties. Uh, in addition, there will be no termination of any kind of services uh, for the only services that we really provide that, that under this term would be uh, water and sewer. So those um, are exempt as well. So, next, so those are the announcements. Next slide. Um, so what we know, we, we will have our revenues in and in our expenditures as of June, as of March 31st, which, which ended last week. Uh, we, that takes about two weeks for everything to get processed in and then we'll have some numbers for the end of March. One of the things I would caution is that those numbers could be good because um, in, under the state, um, trying to get my numbers here, um, their revenues were up for, for the, uh, quarter ending March 3rd, for the month ending March 31st. Uh, they were up by 3%. It's a little misleading because we knew we know the bottom fell out in the um, in this during March. Um, the tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. maybe it's 9 30 a.m. I think actually um, there is a there's a link there. I think it starts at 9 30. Um, there is a there will be a um, economic roundtable with the Senate and House Chairs of Ways and Means and the Secretary of Administration and Finance. And that's the first time we'll really hear from the state directly about what they're projecting for revenues. Um, the independent think tanks at Tufts and at, um, at, at Mass Taxpayers Foundation uh, believe that this will there'll be a, a dramatic collapse in revenues. And with the saying goes is when the uh, state catches a cold, uh, cities and towns get pneumonia. That will probably be the case for us, and that's a really um, scary thing for us if we go forward in our budgeting. Also, because we are delaying uh, the taxes that are collected and that the income taxes are delayed till July 15th, this fiscal year's collections will be pretty weak. So we're anticipating that the next two to three months are going to be especially uh, dismal um, economically from the, from the tax point of view for the, the Commonwealth. And that, play, that flows directly to the town of Amherst. So I want to talk about, so you can go to the next slide. So things that we don't know is we don't know really what our expenditures are going to be for the current year. We're, we are 
expand, we're buying any kind of PPE that we can. We're doing whatever, all the activities that we need to, to be doing right now to address this pandemic. Our, what we don't know is we don't know the revenue forecast for FY21. Um, Sonia and I talk about this pretty much daily and there is really no um, roadmap for what this is going to look like. And I think we will um, rely on our past experience that some counselors have experienced in terms of what it was like the last time uh, the state had a collapse of their revenue sources. I think this is gonna be much more dramatically, this is gonna be dramatically different. And then the other things that we really don't know much about is the budget for FY21. So while we appreciated that the council had delayed the requirement for submitting a budget, I'm not really confident we're going to know a whole lot coming um, into May, June, much more than we know right now. It's, it's, it's gonna be a moving target. And the thing about this is that every city and town is gonna be in the same boat. Uh, so the state will be addressing, helping to address these things we already have last Friday by passing this legislation. Uh, so it will, um, it, it will be focused on this. Um, so next slide. So when we start to think about this, and I think we're not, I'm not, we're not putting numbers up, up there. We will start to talk a little bit more with this, with the finance committee at this meeting tomorrow. Um, so these are sort of the categories of things. And you can see uh, property taxes, even though they're delayed, should be coming in. Uh, but the local receipts that are really dependent on economic, economic vitality, like hotels and meals taxes, um, people purchasing auto, new automobiles, uh, people uh, putting on additions to their houses and things like that, those have just collapsed. And so that whole revenue stream will be gone from the town's uh, budget. Uh, state aid, we have no idea what is going to happen with that because uh, they uh, don't know what they're doing either. And enterprise funds, enterprise funds are our parking revenues for our transportation fund, for water and sewer fees, from, and those are all based on usage. Um, and so those things are dropped off, have dropped off dramatically as well, mainly for the water and sewer, mainly because we have all the college students are not in, in town anymore. So that all that usage is, is, is not, is gone. Um, so our revenues from all those various um, revenue streams will just not be there. We're gonna have to manage that as well. Um, next slide. So what we have been trying to maintain is our operating budgets and the, the state law allows us to over expand certain you know, line items if we need to. We hope we won't need to utilize that. Um, if you know a little bit about budget, the, there is a provision in the law that if, there, if you over expend your snow and ice budget, you can put that on the next year's tax rate. We're going to be working very hard with our department heads to make sure that we aren't overexpending any line items and that we're able to adjust our budgets and our expenditures accordingly. Um, there are certain things that we will have to pay and that's our debt service. And there, there may be some basic things that we need to do on capital, but that's something that we'll want to discuss with uh, the finance committee and with JCPC. Uh, there are certain uh, assessments that we will have to meet for our retirement. The OPEB obligation is a choice that we make. We think that's important for the town's finances, but this might be one of those times when uh, that's the type of thing we need for our, our capital or our operations. Uh, next slide. So we talked about the deadlines that are coming up. Um, there is, uh, so this, the council's already addressed the changing from May 1st, to, from April 1st to May 1st for the school department and the library trustees to submit their budgets, um, uh, the, you uh, gave me allowance to go to June 1st from May 1st for the town manager budget. And tonight uh, you'll have the capital improvement program. I think that's tonight or maybe you already did that um, as well. And we still have the charter requirement of the town council adoption of a budget. There is a provision in the, sta in the state law that allows the town to adopt a 1 12th budget, meaning that we would take it a month at a time for up to three months. There's some chart time frames that we would have to work out to do that. And then we will sort of be monitoring this to see where we want to go and be in you know, direct conversation with the council to see which is the best path forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, so next, we have finance committee meeting tomorrow. Uh, I'll be calling a meeting of the budget coordinating group. The budget coordinating group is set up just for this kind of eventuality. It has representatives from the school committee, the library trustees and the town council. 
and they meet as a group to talk about our revenue forecast, which we had done back in November, I believe it was, or October. And um, these are those, those revenue forecasts have changed dramatically. So we are going to be pulling that group together so we can all be on the same page when we start looking at what the current and FY21 budgets look like. We'll be revising and updating all of our revenue projections based on experience and based on forecasts coming out of the state. Uh, we will develop multiple budget scenarios because there'll be a lot of very difficult decisions to make for uh, the town manager and for the town council in terms of where you want to spend the precious dollars that we have. Uh, are we going to keep them in capital? Are we going to keep them in operating? All of those different things. And then we will have to talk about all the capital improvement plan scenarios. And that's something we can make sort of a short-term decision and bring things back to you uh, at a later date. One thing I do want to emphasize is that we are continuing to send out bills on their regular schedule. So even though the deadline might be delayed to June 1st, uh, we are still sending out bills and they'll have the proper due date on the bills when we send them. Um, so just so people say, hey, I thought, if they, you get a bill at home, you say, hey, I thought I wasn't supposed to get a bill. You will get a bill if the due date is what's changed. Um, and that, you leave that slide up, and I don't know if Sonia, would you like to add anything to any of that, sort of ran through that quickly, because I know the council's got a lot on their agenda tonight. No, you did a great job. You got pretty much everything <laughs> that we talked about this morning. I do want to say that the tax bills are already out there that are due May 1st, so you're not going to see a new tax bill with a new due date. It just known that you're not paying it until June 1st. And I'm, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, and I'm glad you brought up the um, third quarter is really not going to tell us anything because the third quarter revenues that have come in are pretty much right on target. We're not going to really know anything until the next quarter. Are there questions from, is that all, Paul? Yes, thank you. Okay, are there questions from the council at this time, recognizing that this is a moving target and any question you ask now, the answer will probably be, we just don't know. <laughs> Any questions at this time? Kathy. Um, it, when you talk about as we start to know more, so when we get to May and June, um, is there a point where we have to make a yes, we're going to go one month at a time, that one month at a time option. Um, or can we do that right down to the wire? Or I guess the other thing is we don't know yet because this is a, no, a new world that we're living in. So it's a really good question. Uh, it's a question I actually had a conversation with uh, our town attorney today about. Um, and her advice was the deadlines in our charter are, are directive, which means if you don't meet them, there's no one's going to bring you to court to say you, you screwed it up. And under these circumstances, everybody's going to be trying to do their best. And so there's going to be a lot of leeway in trying to do the thing that's in the best interest of the town. I think the important thing is for the town manager and the town council to be in very close communication and that we're having these discussions in public so the public understands what we're doing. I think, you know, it's just about having that conversation out loud in front of people so there, so that there's, as much transparency as we possibly can have for it. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to take it a month, you know, a month at a time. And I think there might be some dates where we say we have to act by, by this date uh, based on state law. But even then, uh, the town attorney feels like there may be corrective action that the legislature might pass because every city is in the same boat. And if we're not, in, we're in as good a shape as any city except Cambridge and the Commonwealth. And so if we're going to have struggle with it, every other city is going to be asking the exact same question. So I think we're going to be in company in terms of if there's uncertainty at a certain point, we're going to be going to the legislature and say we need more relief on this or, or some, some more direction from the Bureau of Accounts. Dorothy, you have a question? Okay, I, I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate very much the strong budgeting um, powers that have been shown that we are in a strong state. Um, I'm very, so I'm very thankful to you, Paul and Sonia, and to all the people who have uh, worked to have Amherst in a strong position. Um, 
I know the challenges are going to be very big and the choice is going to be hard, but at least we're starting from a good place. Yeah. So thank you. I agree. Uh, Andy? Just to you have to unmute Andy. So I wanted to um, thank Paul for the um, report that he gave. I've been doing a lot of work on this and consulting with several other people and including Paul and Sonia to make sure that the finance committee um, is in synchronization with everybody else and that we're all working as a team to get to where we have to be um, in an orderly process, which gets um, to Kathy's question. I read the statute as being very uh, permissive for cities and giving us a lot of discretion. And I had the feeling that that was what Paul was hearing also from um, Lauren when he was talking to her, because um, it starts out with the words, notwithstanding any provisions of this section to the contrary. And then it goes on. That's a pretty broad exception statement. And I, it was not included in that little piece that was in the prior slide. Uh, we're going to be talking about it tomorrow at the finance committee meeting. Um, it is going to be um, broadcast live. We want to try and use the opportunity to start um, making sure that the community is aware of the depth of the problem. But uh, we're just going to have to do the best we can to work together um, and work this out. And uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, reported to the council previously. Uh, it's deeper than we've been, but it's not unprecedented that we've had critical years and uh, we have that experience to fall back on and just hope that even though it is a, a deeper set of problems than we've had before, that we have the guidance to go forward. And I think we have the backup from the legislature to do that too. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council at this time? Okay, then I'd like to move on to the action items on our agenda. The very first action item on the agenda is the um, consent agenda. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later at the meeting ask that it be removed when the president lists the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from a consent agenda does not require a second. So the items on the consent agenda are in fact, referral of bylaw banning use of wild and exotic animals to the community resources committee and automatic referral to the governance organization and legislation committee. Just let me pause for a moment. This is a bylaw that's been proposed by citizens. It's sponsored by uh, Shalini. And uh, it, this is at the very beginning of the discussion. And there's much more opportunity to actually have a discussion in the committee level and then at the council. There is one change to what you've seen and it actually is the removal of the line that deals with museums. The second item on the agenda is acknowledgement of first discussion of amendment to town council rules of procedure, rule 10.8K. This rule particularly deals with liaisons and the specific mention of it is that, um, I'm sorry, is that we would basically every year list those committees for which there would be liaisons. And then the third item on the consent agenda is approval of the March 30, 2020 special town council meeting minutes as presented. Is there anybody who would like any of these items removed? Uh, Darcy, please tell me. Darcy. Has, has the Lincoln Avenue um, item been removed already? I've already taken off for the consent agenda for discussion later. Okay, that's all. Is there anybody else who wants to remove this? 
then I'm going to read it and I'll need a second. This, the motion is to move the following items and printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Referral of bylaw banning use of wild and exotic animals to community resources committee and an automatic referral to governance organization and legislation committee. 7D, acknowledgement of first discussion of amendment to town's council rules of procedure rule 10.8K and 10A is approval of minutes of March 20, 2020, March 30, 2020 special town council minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. DeAngelis. That, that was Pat DeAngelis. And any further discussion? Then I will do a roll call vote. And this time I will start with Alyssa. Please unmute and Brewer, say. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, DeAngelis? Aye. Dumont? Aye. Greasmer is an aye. Haneke? Aye. Pam? Aye. Ross? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Shane? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Steinberg? Aye. Schwartz? Aye. Bellmill? Aye. The motion passes 13 0, zero and no absence. Okay, we are going to go on to the proposed parking regulation changes to Lincoln Avenue. Let me just introduce this by saying we went through a fairly extensive hearing. Um, and that particular hearing focused on Lincoln Avenue. At the time, we then split the request into two things. One was a, an issue about setbacks from intersections. And that's what we're going to deal with tonight. And in fact, this is the second reading. And what we asked for for the second reading was a better set of maps. And we also asked for resolution of particularly a couple intersections where things weren't as consistent with one intersection as they were with another. All of those have been done and the maps are in your uh, folder. We can show them on the screen. The second issue was a much larger issue of whether or not additional areas of Lincoln Avenue would have banned parking. And that issue has actually been referred to the Town Services and Outreach Committee, which met for the first time today. So it's really the two different issues. They've gone two different ways. The one we're talking about tonight is not the broader issue of no parking. It is the issue of setbacks so that there's greater visibility at the intersections. Sean, could we please show the maps? There are six total. Is this what you were looking for? The, uh, no, I'm sorry. These are not what I was looking for. Oh, the, the three individual ones? These are the three individual ones that just show the setbacks. Okay, Thank hold on. I'll pull those up, but I'll take a moment. Thank you. just waiting for the uh, correct maps regarding the setbacks to be brought up. Let me just say that one of the confusions about the setbacks was some were, some were 30 and some were 60. 
uh, except for where they exceed that amount, we have now changed them all to 60. And so that it's a very consistent motion. And the motion that's in your packet actually asks that we repeal existing restrictions and then enact additional restrictions. Again, though it's around parking, it is all around setbacks. So if you go to the top of the map here, you'll see McClellan Street, and you'll see that there's no parking within 60 feet of the intersection at McClellan. And then you come down and on the, when you look at Elm Street, there's no parking there anyway. And then when you come down to the intersection of Amity Street and Lincoln, you have par no parking within 200 feet of the intersection. Next slide. These slides, by the way, are public and in the packet for the town council tonight. So they're available to the public and also to the council. Okay. And so here, here's where you start on to um, Fearing Street. And then you get to McClellan. Now there's no parking on the Fearing Street side, but at McClellan, again, we put both of those at 60 feet within the intersection. And so could we keep on going, please? Here's one final map. Okay, and this is the part that's south of Amity that was not really part of the original discussion, but while we were at it, we wanted to make sure we looked at it. And we again, look at the south of Amity is 120 feet at Gaylord, it's 60 feet with no parking on either side. And then also at no parking within the intersection, 120 feet between Northampton Road and, the, um, and Lincoln Avenue. Are there questions from the council before we move to the motion? Pat. You need to unmute, Pat. Pat, you need to unmute. Trying. Okay, there it is. I kept hitting it, but it didn't work. Um, I'm curious, you talked about consistency um, you have a 200-foot setback on Lincoln and Amity, I'm assuming because that's a particularly difficult intersection. But when we, the map before this, when Fearing and Lincoln meet, there is no setback on um, the, cor the corner of Lincoln and Fearing on one side and I, on the map. Um, um, so I want, I, could you please find that? Yeah. So I'm assuming there would be a setback there. Yeah, see what I mean? Okay. If you look at the bottom where McClellan and Lincoln, you can see the setback on both sides of the intersection. But here at Fearing, you can only see a setback on one side of the intersection. Right, I see what you're saying. So are you suggesting that you would like to see a setback well, I'm trying to understand why that one is different uh, and if it was just overlooked or is there a particular reason? Very good question. Paul, do you want to speak to that question? Um, I would like to, but I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's, if we don't have sufficient information, we'll bring this back to the next week's council. So what I'd like to do is see what other questions we have. So this question specifically focused on fearing where we see the yellow and therefore there's parking prohibited Monday through Friday, but there's no restriction from within the intersection of 
either 20, either 60 or 200 feet. Kathy, do you have a question? Yes, I do. On Gaylord, if you go to the Gaylord map, and I'm looking at our motion, um, as opposed to just the map, the motion has the number 30 and the number 60. Are we saying, and I believe that Gaylord right now is 30, and we were going to go to the go to 60, but the motion literally says 30 and then paren 60 with um so it's a question of what it is that's being proposed for Gaylord. 60 would make it consistent with all the others, and 30 would be consistent with what it is now. So what we're the motion is written both ways, is what I'm saying. I've got right. both numbers in it. And so the recommendation is to go to 60 so that it's consistent all the way through. Then, the motion, that. then I think the motion needs to be edited because it says change it in the following way. And then the bullet literally has for a distance of 30 per 60 feet north and south. So it's it's got a little 60 got stuff it. in it. Do you see what I'm seeing? Yes, yeah. I do. Thank okay. you. Are there other questions, Dorothy? Hello. Um, when I do this, I can't see the maps underneath it, but um, so that's 200 feet on um, Amity, but it's 120 feet w to Northampton. Is that correct? That yeah. is what the map says, yes. Okay. I guess I'm, um, I know Amity is a very bad intersection, but we certainly heard that it was a difficult intersection from Northampton Road, which is a very highly traveled road. So I was wondering why that was 120. Okay. I'll add that to the questions. And Shalini, oh, Mandy Jo, you're next. So I will try to answer the Pat's question. Um, since I, I drafted the motion based on what we had referred to TSO and what wasn't referred to TSO and all of the um, Fearing Street and McClellan to Fearing Street parking restrictions were referred to TSO. Um, and one of them was the 30 foot setback. Um, right now it's already got, it looks like on the map, it doesn't have any setback, but it has the no parking eight to five or nine to five, um, Monday to Friday anyway, um, that would not be repealed in this motion. So that would remain in effect, even if we pass the motion tonight. Um, and I think the setback portion of that change was referred to TSO. Okay, Chalini. Um, could someone just summarize what the final loss will be of the parking and how it's how it's affecting the other neighborhoods. I'm so sorry if we've already been through this, but I really cannot remember All right. what the effects are. Let me try to do that in a more broad way. The issue of adding any more significant no parking zones on either either side of this street has been referred to TSO. When TSO looks at that, they certainly have the option, in fact, it was discussed today, about the possibility that they should look at surrounding neighborhoods of the university in general, not just Lincoln Ave. Um, the only thing we're dealing with tonight is setbacks. That means setbacks from intersections. Some of those exist, some of those would be um, added, and some of those would be lengthened. Alyssa. I was just going to say that I know we, we went around quite a bit as to how comprehensive our first action would be associated with this project. And I'm feeling comfortable as was developed this afternoon, thanks to Manny Jo pulling that together, that this is the safety issue. And so to me, it doesn't really matter how many spaces we're losing in terms of me voting for this safety issue but I would like someone to be keeping track of that number as we're having the rest of the conversation. Okay, Dorothy. I agree totally with Alyssa. The complaints that first came in were about being unable to make a turn from Fearing from McClellan onto Lincoln 
without pulling into the deep, deep into the intersection blind. So safety is what's going on here. The other issue, I imagine we'll talk about it in great detail and uh, we'll deal with that later. But I, I do think this is the way to deal with it, breaking it into the two issues. Thank you. Um, we have two options. One is to refer this back and get more information. One would be about the issue regarding Fearing Street where there's restricted parking by a certain hour, but then there's no setback. The second is why not 200 feet off of Northampton Road? And the third one we already did resolve, which was the 30 versus 60. Um, if there is an interest in moving forward and leaving those others issues, uh, then I would ask for a motion. And I'm gonna ask somebody else to read the motion. Um, Mandy Jo, perhaps you might read the motion. I was just going to raise my hand to do so. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I move to do the following. Repeal the following existing parking restrictions voted by the select board on July 27, 2015. The parking prohibited is a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue, 120 feet north of the intersection of Northampton Road. The parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue, 30 feet north and south of Gaylord. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue, 120 feet north and south of Amity. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the west side of Lincoln Avenue, 30 feet south of Elm Street. And parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east side of Lincoln Avenue, 30 feet south of McClellan Street. And repeal the following additional parking restrictions. The parking prohibited as a tow zone on the west side of Lincoln Avenue from Elm Street to Fearing Street. And enact the following parking restrictions. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue for a distance of 120 feet north of the intersection of Northampton Road. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue for a distance of 60 feet north and south of Gaylord Street. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east and west side of Lincoln Avenue for a distance of 200 feet north and 100 feet, 120 feet south of Amity Street. Parking prohibited as a tow zone on the west side of Lincoln Avenue, beginning 200 feet north of Amity Street to North Hadley Road. And parking prohibited as a tow zone on the east side of Lincoln Avenue for a distance of 60 feet north and south of McClellan Street. Is there a second? Second, Ryan. Thank you. Is there further discussion? George? That was my second, I'm sorry. Okay, Darcy? Mandy Jo, maybe uh, could you just explain, and maybe this has already been explained, but what is the reason for different um, different lengths of setbacks? First, you mean 30 versus 60 or 200 versus 120? Yes. That would have to come from Paul as it's his departments that recommended those different feats. Okay. I'd have to look at the, let me, if we have, let me look up the memo that was submitted a month or two ago to the council. Okay. Meantime, Dorothy Pam. Okay, I strongly support the motion and I hope that it passes. Uh, the difference of foot, footage was done by the transportation department um, based on, I think, usage and um, their experience. Okay. Um, are there other questions at this time? Paul, do you, you don't want to try to find that tonight, do you? Uh, yeah, I don't see an obvious answer to that question. I think it basically is our traffic engineers making the judgment call. That's, that would be my recollection based on the memo. Is there any further discussion? Dorothy, do you still have your hand up or just waiting to take no, it down? I don't. I have to lower the hand. Thank you. Okay. Mm. There we go. All right. Any further discussion at this time? Hearing none, then I'll do a roll call vote. This time I will begin with DeAngelis. Pat. 
Um, yes. Dumont? Yes. Reesmers, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Joan? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Balmilm? Yes. Brewer? Brewer? Alyssa? Yes, I'm sorry, it wasn't registered. Not to worry. Okay, I believe that was 1300 and none absent. Um, we're moving on in our agenda then to um, committee reports and uh, some of the committees are meeting soon, but others have submitted reports and one committee met today. Mandy Jo, CRC. I submitted a written report. That's all we've got for now. And we will meet on Wednesday morning and elections will be held to elect chair, vice chair, and we'll be discussing some zoning process issues um, and be presenting the first very rough draft of a land use section of the master plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Finance Committee, Andy? Nothing additional. Okay. Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, George. Yeah, our report is in the packet uh, for people to read. Uh, we did not, we will not be meeting this week as it probably was announced at the top of the meeting. Uh, the next scheduled meeting would be April 22nd. Okay. Uh, JCPC, Kathy. Uh, Kathy, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you. We sent out a notice this week that JCPC won't be meeting till at least uh, the week of April 20th, which the normal meeting is a Wednesday. So that would be the 22nd. And if you uh, put in the context of Paul's, what we don't know about the revenues and the expenditures of the town, and then say, and the capital, is a share of that, what percentage, what, what will be available, it's equally or even more uncertain. So we are going to probably try to meet that week to just share what we know at that point, but um, I'm really urging everyone to stay tuned on what the Finance Committee will be hearing because it's gonna be very much driving what JCPC, whether we have any decisions. Um, for those who've been following JCPC, we did start to hear um, departments. So we had the library and the schools come in and we had one resident capital request, but I'm assuming everything is on hold till we have more information. Thank you. Outreach communications and appointments, ad hoc committee, Evan. Yep, so uh, the only announcement is that we will be holding interviews for uh, candidates to fill uh, some of the vacancies on the ZBA the evening of April 16th. That meeting is scheduled for April 16th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, so if we do have to hold the second night of the school committee deliberation, this meeting would occur after that um, with the goal of having a recommendation to the council for the council's April 27th meeting. Okay. And the Town Services and Outreach Committee, Darcy was elected chair of that committee today. Darcy? Darcy, you have to unmute. Oh, I am unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, started out today, uh, starting to get our bearings as a committee. Uh, we elected chair and vice chair. Evan was elected vice chair. And um, we uh, looked at the list of items that has been sent over by the um, Community Resources Committee, and we're going to try to figure out a method for prioritizing them and uh, looking at um, different means of uh, reviewing and making recommendations. Um, that was also suggested by the Community Resource Committee. 
We had one action item that uh, we didn't actually have to act on today. And uh, that was the uh, rec recommendation of appointment of a finance director, which we hope to get from the town manager uh, so that we can act on it next Monday. We set a, our next meeting for Monday at 1130. So that would be Monday the 13th at 1130. Right. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the uh, any of the committees? Kathy, you have your hand up. Yes, I just I had a question, Evan. Um, you said you're when you're meeting, you're going to be interviewing and filling some of the positions. Do you have a sense at this point on how many slots you're trying to fill? Uh, I do not. That will depend on um, the feeling of the committee based on the interviews. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions of the of the committee chairs? All right, then moving on, uh, we've approved the minutes. Uh, Paul Bachelman, your town manager's report. Thank you. Uh, I submitted a pretty detailed town manager's report, so I hope you take a time to read it. Um, there, so because the hour is getting longer on these types of things, they seem longer. Um, I'm going to mention uh, four things. One is um, the uh, census is up and running. Uh, our complete count committee is uh, still active. It's under all new rules, as we obviously know. Our response rate is at 48.4%. We need to get that much better, much much higher. Um, so we're working with the university and the colleges. I think we'll be okay on those fronts. They've all been super cooperative. Um, but you know, just putting a little uh, competition out there for our um, counselors to see that uh, that. North Amherst is doing, you know, needs need to pick up the game there uh, because we want to make sure we get everybody counted. It's really important. The second item is the, um, um, I want to note that the supportive housing uh, at 132 Northampton Road had received its uh, project eligibility letter, letter. That gives them the opportunities to submit an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a comprehensive permit. They indicated that that would happen at the end of April, which uh, starts the clock ticking that the, um, um, the ZBA would want to have a hearing within 30 days of that. Uh, not clear exactly how all the um, land use uh, tolling of clocks will play into that, but we'll be working with them to make sure it, the neighborhoods are, the neighbors are fully engaged and the community is fully engaged. Um, the, one of the things that we're dealing with on the um, uh, COVID-19 front is the farmer's market, which is scheduled to open soon. We're working with them um, because uh, to create more social distance because having access to fresh food is really important, but having having protections in place to make sure people can access the farmer's market and it doesn't become a social gathering place is important. Uh, we sort of liken it to having a grocery store. People go to the grocery store to buy vegetables uh, and so we're looking at different ways that we can uh, manage this uh, properly. There have been several articles and a lot of work on, done on this already in different communities. And the State Department of Agriculture has given us some guidance on the types of things. So we will have a, a plan from the farmer's market in terms of how they would implement proper social distancing, how they would enforce it. We will be monitoring it to make sure that it's in compliance. Um, and the last thing is, um, you know, I. Uh, I often will thank our employees and what a great job they are, but we also still have a lot of volunteers who are working, especially uh, with the Senior Center on the Meals on Wheels program. And so it's really um, brave to be, for people to be step, continuing to step up. And I wanna thank all the volunteers who are out there doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there's always room for more volunteers. The Senior Center, if you read the report, they're making uh, over a thousand phone calls to people to make sure they're doing okay. We, they have a friendly visitor virtually um, program so that people stay engaged. So just a, um, a note that uh, they, the Senior Center is looking for people to help out and a thank you to all the volunteers. And that's, um, oh, one last thing. Uh, we are working on a new website for the Ken, uh, Kendrick Park Playground because that we haven't really, that, that's continued to be worked and the people working remotely and this is one of the things that they can actually do is build the website. And so that will be announced pretty soon. So that concludes my report. Okay. 
Dorothy, you have a question? Yeah, yes. Um, the question is um, the date of the TSO meeting. I had put down that it was going to be the 13th of April, and not the 27th. So I just wanted to clarify the date of that meeting. It is on the 13th at 1130. Okay. Okay. Mandy Jo? Yes. Um, question on the census, that 48% response rate, do we know whether that includes all the students living on campus or whether those numbers have not yet been submitted and counted into that percentage? Because if it does include that, we got a ways to go. If it doesn't, we might be doing better than we think. It does not include them. Okay. okay. We're looking for a great update in the future, but counselors, let's get out to our constituents, especially those District 1 people. Alyssa? Yes, I had two things, please. One was um, a comment on 132 Northampton Road. It's so nice that that's moving apace. It's just so frustrating given where we are. And as you indicated, I just wanted to emphasize that I believe that what we'll be doing, based on what you've said, is that you'll be working with the applicant to say, you know, if you file by the end of April, according to what's happened at the state level, as you mentioned, the tolling, according to the way I, who am not an attorney, read the KP law guidance, all those deadlines are gonna be pushed way out in terms of like time after the emergency. So I understand that they may feel like they need to get started. I realize we have other hearings that are happening, right, where they're calling the ZBA to order and then they're uh, continuing the hearing. But, uh, you know, I'm hoping they're thinking through whether or not they actually need to do that in order to meet with their end of the processes. So it's not to just increase the amount of trouble it is for staff to do this, for the ZBA to call to order and then just to go ahead and move on, et cetera, if they can just wait. But if their funding requires them to like get their, you know, get this stake in the ground now, I understand that too. I just hope that people aren't feeling pressured because as you said, we want to make sure the neighbors are are clearly addressed here and i don't think we're prepared to do that in the normal time frame the other one completely different topic on the farmers market as much as i support the farmers market both with my dollars and with the work i used to do on the select board i'm really concerned that the farmers market is going to have to look radically different if they think they're going to function because there's literally no way social distancing works in any kind of setup like we've ever had. And I would also, as of course all of you know, because you go there all the time too, the products in April are not fresh food products. Um, as much as I love the pre-made products and I know that it's going to impact those farmers greatly, we don't be needing to go outside to get prepackaged products. So I'm just really nervous about what we're trying to accommodate there and how realistic that really is. So I look forward to your updates as that continues to be worked through. Are there any other questions? Dorothy? Yes. Um, I think that for the farmer's market, there can get plenty of guidance from the Union Square Farmer's Market in New York City. There have been some major articles written recently about how the farmer's market is more important than ever. Of course, it will have to be redone, but one of the things is that the customers will not be touching any of the food. Um, there's a, a whole protocol that has been developed and um, you know, there's a lot of people to learn from. So I hope that we do see the farmer's market in a new safer format soon. Okay, Shalini. Please unmute. Sorry about that. I just want to echo what Dorothy was saying about the farmer's market. And we've seen uh, amazing changes in our grocery stores, the local ones and um, uh, the national ones. And I believe that we can put in place those very strict. And I think all, all the residents are really aware and following these rules. So if we have all the protocol in place, we could be thoughtful and put something in place, but keep keep that farmer's market going. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Steve. Yes, I want to echo what Dorothy and Shalini were saying that now more than ever, we need to support the local farms through the farmer's market and through, you know, the various farm stands. 
but there's a great story and I think it's today's globe about how how important the local farms are to the Metro Boston area. So I'm sure that we can figure out how to how to make it work, particularly because the parking load is less now, now that the hotels are you know essentially closed, et cetera, et cetera. So Paul, I believe uh, that the proposal from the farmers market, because it's long-term use of public way, has to come to the council. Am I correct on that? I think that may have already been done. I can't, I have to look back on whether that's already been approved. It might require additional, our expectation would be they would seek additional use of public way in order to create the social distancing. Uh, so it's basically, we've asked them to come up with a social distancing plan for us uh, that we would review with our health agents. Um, and they're, you know, and I think, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion about this out there in the department. Again, the Department of Agriculture has very strict guidelines about how you handle money and things like that. Uh, some farmers markets have admission, you know, they only let a certain number of people in. So it's not just an open thing. There are like gateways you have to walk through and they monitor the number of people. Um, let me see what it requires if it has to come back to the council in terms of if they are re asking for additional parking lots or parking on the streets. Um, I, I will double check on that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Mandy Jo? I don't think we've dealt with the farmer's market at all this year for this farmer's market season. I for agree. any public way requests. So we should I agree. That if it would be required for us to deal with even the 20 some weeks that they normally request. Right. Dorothy? I just wanted to remind um, the council that if people with EBT cards, with food stamps or SNAP benefits, you get, get food from the farmer's market, they get a bonus of dollars until that money, state money runs out. So it is an added way of getting food to people who need it. Right. Okay, any other questions of Paul at this time? Then let me just mention a couple things, mostly for counselors, but also for the public. And that is, first of all, uh, I really want to thank you for your patience in scheduling uh, the various committee meetings. We're trying to space them out. We're trying to make sure that we have people properly trained on Zoom to the point that over time, uh, people who are chairing committees and the people who are on the committees may be able to be much more in charge of the production of them as well. And this brings me to the reason that so far, we really have not been scheduling committees of the town um, because again, it takes so much just to get to the point you can produce a meeting that is public, that allows for public comment and also is can be available to the public then in a recorded way, as all of our town committees of the town need to be. So we have um, are getting better, and we're getting there, and um, we are putting out guidelines, and Athena and Brianna and Angela uh, have been working closely with the IT people to get there as fast as we possibly can. But putting on a meeting like this takes a lot more work than putting on a meeting in the town room. So I just want to thank you for your patience and ask you for your continued patience in all of that. Uh, we will be meeting on the 13th and unless there is an emergency, we will not be meeting on April 20th. Are there any counselor comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, then I am going to, uh, no topics not reasonably anticipated, um, and I'm going to adjourn the town council meeting at this time.